Atra šī ir škot? Jā. Jā. Tu tie pinalā? O, tas ir tā? Nē. Jā. Ja, es tik gut. Hello, although we announced our um, event in German, we will talk in English today. If you have difficulties to follow us, please let us know in the chat, then we will translate. We have our science afternoon today to this topic uh, on the topic of health data and digital technology on an international level. It's a very special edition because it's this, with our partner, the think tank for us. We will ask our, us the questions, how can, we, uh, how can we improve our health system? What did we learn with the COVID app? What do we need for a COVID certificate? Now um, I have the choice and gladly announce you Florence Balthazar as a member of the committee of four hours who will um, do her own welcome. Thank you very much for coming and thank you to all the members of four hours for collaborating with the Swiss academies. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, good afternoon from my side uh, to everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this science uh, afternoon in my function of uh, board member of Four House. Uh, Four House is the Swiss think tank on foreign policy. Uh, and I would like first to warmly thank the Swiss Academies of Arts and Sciences for letting Four House co-organize this edition of uh, the science afternoon. Um, for House is a grassroots think tank, and, and our mission is to develop independent and high quality recommendations for Swiss foreign policy makers, decision makers, and for the public. And in that sense, I believe we do share a common goal with the Swiss academies. Um, over the past years, For House developed a strong expertise on the topic of international digital health, and we're therefore very pleased to be able to contribute to today's debate which is, I believe, more relevant than ever in the current pandemic. And with those words, I, I hand over back to Claudia, who will introduce today's topic and our speakers. Thank you, and I wish you a good event. Thank you very much, Florence. We know Florence for a long time, and at a day like today, it's especially important to have in our environment people on, who understand the international and above all the European relations and science. Um, we know Florence from um, her uh, task at Swiss Corp, which uh, really helped a lot of scientific organizations for many years. And now I have the choice, um, I gladly can introduce you to Moritz Feger. Moritz, maybe you can just uh, give us a hello. This is Moritz. Um, he is at Foraus uh, as a project manager. He was the leader of the Health Data Governance Project. He studied international relations in Geneva and in different other countries. And we are happy to have you with us. Just one sentence. What is your current topic which you um, follow right now? Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction, Claudia. I've been uh, following closely the immunity certification schemes that have been developed in the, in the last uh, weeks and months, amongst many other things. Thank you very much. Then I can introduce you, Katrin Kramery, as a director of personal health informatics at the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. She has a Master of Public Health and a PhD in Neuroscience and is also part of the SBHN initiative, the Swiss Personalized Health Network initiative. And she provides also advice to authorities and scientists for future project and a future health system. Um, what is your current topic of um, action right now? Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Claudia. Hello, everybody. My name is Katrin. Um, um, 
we are in SPHN, we are entering the second phase of this uh, important uh, infrastructure, research infrastructure initiative, and we are in the process of consolidating the network components that we have built closely collaborating with the Swiss University hospitals to um, make data, health data, routine health data, better shareable and exchangeable for research. Thanks a lot. And then I can introduce you Marcel Salate. We all know him. He was the first voice heard when the pandemic started. He is head of the Digital Epidemiology Lab at the EPFL. Uh, he's a biologist, but he knows a lot about uh, artificial intelligence, about new developments. And what is your current topic of um, action right now, Marcel Salate? Well, thank you. Um, so my current focus is finally again on my actual research, which is a which is a great relief. Um, and that actually is not related to infectious disease. It's still epidemiology, but it's closer to nutrition. And so there we're using mobile technology and artificial intelligence to to get a handle on this link between nutrition and and health outcomes. Thanks a lot. That sounds really interesting. Um, then I can introduce you Agata Ferretti. Agata Ferretti wrote her doctoral thesis at the Lund School of Economics and at the Health and Ethics and Policy Lab of ETH Zurich. Uh, she had a PhD which was funded by SNF and she is very interested in ethical questions around personalized health, medicine, around artificial intelligence. What is your current topic of activity right now, Agatha? Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. Um, so yeah, my, my PhD, who I defended, which I defended last month, was about um, the ethics and governance of big data in health research and digital health applications. And now I'm interested in continuing this research more towards the use of digital health for global health. Okay, so we see we have a really great panel who covers different aspects of internationalization, of ethics, and of science. And now I have the pleasure to uh, give Moritz Feger the possibility to give us insight in the study which Voraus conducted on this very topic. Thank you, Claudia, and thank you for the opportunity to talk a bit more about our work on health data governance and digital health of labs at Voraus. Um, so what I will do now is uh, give a brief context on, on our work from last year and also uh, bring forward three main, main, main arguments, main points for today's discussion. So last year we, held, we organized a um, Swiss-wide participatory process with around 140 stakeholders and uh, interested citizens. Uh, asking the question, how can we leverage the potential of health data and digital technology so that it benefits society at large? And also, what position uh, should Switzerland take in the, on this discussion and this, on this topic and international Geneva and more specifically uh, regarding health data exchange in a cross-border context, in an international context? And out of this came a publication which was uh, published uh, last December with 12 policy recommendations. And now I'd like to share three main messages out of this, uh, this publication. Yeah. So first of all, we, we say international Geneva should, uh, become, uh, should be, become a should become a global hub for, for health data governance. It should be the place where initiatives start um, and, um, and where health data exchange at the international level is supported. And there are already initiatives uh, going on in Geneva, which should be further financed and, and also politically supported by, by Switzerland and provide, Switzerland should sort of provide the framework conditions so that uh, Geneva can really leverage this potential because there's a lot of health related, uh, global health related organizations already, but in the field of uh, health data governance, there's, um, there's still room, there's room for, for more. And also from a regulatory side, we said we need uh, international health data regulations in the long run. We need uh, regulatory space to uh, sort of give a framework um, to uh, health data exchange internationally. And uh, this is on their ongoing discussions at the World Health Organization, but uh, there, there is need for more political support so that Switzerland should also um, take an, an active role. But we are aware that from, uh, because, of, um, uh, because of differences between cultures and cultural differences in the handling of health data, 
this is maybe not in the short and medium term realistic. So what we say as a second point is that Switzerland should really look at its like-minded partners. And here we say, well, the European Union actually, from a regulatory perspective, is the leading force when it comes to the regulation of health data, uh, of, of data, um, uh, data exchange and the data privacy, and also the regulation of AI and digital technologies and platforms. And so we said, with the, U the European Union is, uh, is a key partner for Switzerland and is also developing, um, is also working on initiatives and projects such as the health data space, uh, which is a health data ecosystem where data will be, a will be um, exchangeable between member states for research purposes, but also for individual purposes for citizens. And there Switzerland should really um, more proactively uh, join again uh, discussions within the European Union because it has been part of this, but it has been um, removed from, from existing um, uh, organizations and, and uh, discussions. And yeah, really we see a potential um, for, for Switzerland, even though as of yesterday, it might become more difficult. Um, we really encourage Switzerland to, to, to see the potential there and move forward. And last but not least, uh, the third, uh, third key point of, uh, of our study is that the citizens, uh, citizens should be much more empowered and included in these, um, the development of these technologies, but also then in the use of health data. And transparency is another key, key aspect that we see as, as, as really important. So processes around the design of digital technologies that use health data and, um, and also the, the whole information cycle around, around what kind of data is used, how is it exchangeable, um, where is it stored, what, how does the architecture of um, around the whole health data technology or these technologies uh, is looking like this should be shared with citizens more openly and, um, and citizens should also be empowered much more, have a more participatory, uh, a more active role. And for this, we need health data literacy as well. So um, I would stop here, just the last, uh, last point. Um, all these three aspects, the need for international regulation and guidelines that should be followed internationally, um, the, the importance of the European Union in this field also for Switzerland, and um, the inclusion and participation of citizens and transparency are also really relevant when we talk about digital technologies that are used in the context of COVID-19 as tracing apps or also uh, this COVID certification scheme. So um, yeah, looking forward to for discussion, to discussion and, uh, and questions later on. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this insight. Katrin Kramery, you know this study quite well because you gave some input. What are the most important points for your field? Yeah, I know the study well. I think it gives a, a, a very nice and comprehensive overview of the different areas that uh, should or could uh, make use of uh, health data. And I think it also nicely points out the possibilities and uh, the potential that uh, there is in using this data. There is I, um, just one uh, a remark from my side working in the, uh, in the very, let's say, nitty gritty details of uh, when we try to use really health data for different purposes. And that um, is a bit neglected in the study, which is the fact that when we um, uh, studies uh, like the one that uh, Moritz just described and also others, they um, may basically um, think of how can we use this data? How can we better make use of the data? And uh, for me, the question is more, is this data really usable? So do we have to invest uh, a lot in the quality or in the structure of the data in order to efficiently can or uh, being able to use it? And I think this is really an important point. I would uh, drop the, the term now interoperability. Some of us can't even uh, hear it anymore, but uh, I'm sorry to say that this is the most important part of it. And um, I think this is a, it's, it's a good way to address it from many different uh, angles, but we have to also uh, make sure if we uh, think of data governance and the use and international uh, sharing of data, we always have to really see, can we really use the data? Can we make use of it? Marcel Salate, you are one of the pioneers of using data for research. What is your input about this study? Yeah, no, I think it, it, it raises important points. And obviously as someone who works um, in Geneva, it also resonates with me that it's, it would be good to 
to find the one place to yeah to to navigate these waters in Geneva could be a very good place I mean I um, I guess one thing I would say is that um, it will nevertheless be important that the the actors that participate in these discussions actually also have the relevant expertise. And that's kind of obvious in most discussions, but I noticed in the past decade, if you will, that a lot of technology discussions are going on where there's sometimes very little um, technology expertise around. It sort of reminds me on this panel about uh, women rights where there's just guys and um, that's you know that's that can be obviously pro problematic for for I think clear reasons and I think it's also important that Geneva sort of contributes its part to that and the international organizations I mean there's many health organizations we unfortunately know are technologically not quite at the level that we would want them and need them to be and I think it's not just politics that needs to say, oh, we should really make you know, Geneva the place, but it's also the organizations that are in Geneva should up their game um, when it comes to technology and data competence. Is the health data discussion only about technology, Agatha Ferretti, or are there other aspects which need to be more internationally interoperable? <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, absolutely. I think, uh, well, I work in the field of ethics, so definitely there are other important issues, but um, I really um, understand it, the perspective that Maurice just, just presented, and I absolutely agree that there is a need for, for international global minimum standards for both governance and ethics, because uh, what my I, I saw in my research is that big data projects, you know, and, and health, digital health projects are um, now more and more across borders and they involve a lot of different institutions and, and research centers. And the problem is that if we rely on, on local, uh, you know, regulations and data governance, there is a, a scattered jungle of, of this regulation and different institutions provide their own perspectives, which obviously promote certain ethical issues. Uh, of course, privacy and confidentiality has been discussed a lot and was at the forefront also uh, at a European Union level. But the problem is like there is not just privacy and confidentiality as issue. And of course, as we as as was mentioned before, there are issues related to uh, data integration and data quality, and what does it mean if data um, data sets are not representative of, of the population? Or you know, there are so many 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 issues that should be discussed, and we should um, definitely set a kind of uh, common ground across countries, both in terms of ethics and governance. Thanks a lot for this input. Uh, what did we learn with the COVID app, Marcel Salati? I thought we have only one hour. Um, what, <laughs> what did we learn with the COVID app? Um, um, well, okay, in, in one sentence, I would say uh, with many commas, maybe we learned that uh, we can certainly develop technology quickly. We can develop it at a high level um, we can do it in such a way that it's actually very privacy preserving. So it's it, technology does not always have to be a data, um, you know, uh, yeah, vacuumer, um, vacuum cleaner. And, and then we also learned obviously that technology, developing technology without ensuring its proper into integration into the system um, and without the acceptance of the population it's not, not going to work, but it's going to have a very, very limited impact compared to what it could. Um, I guess that, that's probably one of the biggest takeaways. Okay. What did other people of this panel learn? Maurice Feiger, did you deal with the COVID app? Yeah, maybe just a quick reaction to what Catherine Camere said. We, we did take into account the interoperability and, and uh, the technical aspects uh, and the fact that data needs to be usable uh, into the study, I just didn't have time to go through all the points. But 
uh, about the COVID, um, the COVID app, um, I think what we saw is that it's really key that the public is uh, engaged and from the start by public health authorities and, and other authorities who are involved in, in designing these, uh, these systems, these apps, because people need to understand uh, the purpose and need to understand how it works. Uh, to then trust it and use it, because I think we saw that uh, these tracing apps haven't taken up as we would have like, liked them to do, and so we couldn't use them as effectively, maybe. Um, and so the purpose is really key. Uh, now with uh, COVID certification uh, systems, you see that um, people see a purpose because they can maybe then uh, they see that it might facilitate uh, um, uh, mobility again. I mean, of course, it depends really on the systems but, um, and on the conditions, but people do start to see a, a purpose. And there's, I have the feeling, a bit of less backlash, even though uh, we have less, um, less consultation or less time for consultation than maybe with the tracing app. That's just a feeling, but um, maybe, yeah, Marcel, tell it you want to react. Mm -hmm. just, just maybe something I, I, I would like to add here, and I would be curious to hear other people's views because. Now, we fought extremely hard, right, that this app is actually voluntary. The consequence of which is that now a lot of people say, well, you know, what, what should I have used it for? Now we have this COVID certificate and we're like, you know, sorry, but we're going to re restrict your freedoms if you don't use it. And all of a sudden people say, oh, great, now I see a purpose. So it leaves a little question mark, right, in my mind of, where, what road does this lead us down to? Does this essentially mean that in the future for technology to be accepted, especially quickly, we kind of have to make it mandatory? That would really bother me, but you know, it's a sort of an open question I wanna, I wanna throw out there. Now, this is an ethical question. Agatha Ferretti, what do you think? Uh, I, I think, well, there are other ways probably, and I think uh, the communication aspect is really important. We conducted a research with um, Professor Efi Vallena and Dr. Blasime at the, the, the lab, the Health Ethics and Policy Lab, and we actually saw how um, in eight European countries, uh, like the, these digital contact tracing apps for COVID have, have evolved. Uh, over over time, and they introduce new features, right? So from being just contact tracing apps, they started introducing um, new, new aspects, for example, tracking symptoms or um, uh, scanning QR code to enter restaurants and so on. And I think more and more these, these features uh, have been introduced, more these apps also became kind of appealing to the public because they were kind of useful in the sense of like allowing them to do things. And, and so also many countries have, have change their way of promoting these apps and, and, and so on. And, and therefore, I think there, is, there are other ways that are not necessarily make them mandatory to make them more acceptable. And I think another point that we uh, realized in, in, in our research is that um, how these, these um, apps are presented and the governance of this app is really important because we noticed that um, in general, the oversight of this app is quite weak. Um, especially because all these health apps that are not medical devices are not really vetted by any oversight mechanism. And so I think to increase the trust of the public also in these devices, we need to improve also the oversight mechanisms to govern them. And, and I think this is possible and there is a trajectory there that we, we should explore and think about more carefully that goes beyond really the privacy preserving uh, aspect that obviously like was was um, really embraced in, with this COVID app, but I think there are other issues again um, that uh, should be explored about equity, about access uh, of, of these technologies and so on. Of course, we also would like to know what our public thinks about these questions. Caroline, can you maybe show us the survey we prepared? Uh, we would like to know whether the data which uh, we get when you, or which are um, um, perceived when you have a health examination, um, should they be ready to, for research if they are anonymized? Um, and then we would also know whether you uh, have the COVID app on your phone 
Uh, we would also like to know whether you would use the COVID certificate if you could go traveling again and to big events. And then we would also know more about your reflection on the reasons why you would decide to have a digital um, application. Is it because it's the use and the purpose which is really high and the effectiveness is high? Is it because it's anonymous or are you not sure whether you would use it and you can cross also, I don't know enough about it. So uh, we will later talk about your answers. Um, the questions and the answers are anonymous, of course. Um, we, we heard about interoperability. Uh, I would like to know from Katrin Kramery, what is interoperability and why is it so important? Um, well, when we think of bringing data together from different sources, right? I mean, we want to, um, if we think of uh, making use of large uh, or big data, even uh, from the health sector for different purposes. Um, we always have uh, different sources that produce the data or that gather the data. And of course, um, they all have their certain way to do this. So how can we, for example, as a researcher, make sure that when we combine data from one hospital with data from another hospital, for example, that we do not compare apples and oranges. We need to make sure that the data that we put all in one pot for the analysis uh, we can, we can compare the data. The data is understandable to us uh, in order for us to do a good judgment on how we do the analysis. And this is the biggest uh, problem at the moment. When we look at the different sources where we get data from when we, that, we, that are used for um, uh, research projects or research uh, purposes, uh, for example, we have the routine data that is captured during the healthcare processes. Uh, with the view to healthcare delivery, not to the with the view to research, for example. We have uh, in the field of Marcel Sadati, for example, more the uh, public health data or even um, data, as he said, on nutrition that comes from totally different sources. We have devices, we have mobile apps that uh, gather data. And when we think of the more laboratory settings and the research setting, we have basically um, um, genomic data, transcriptomic, proteomic, metabolomic, all the omics uh, data that are generated and um, uh, basically are combined then in big data sets for the analysis. Here we have to be sure that we have a common understanding of what the data really mean. And as long as we have this common understanding, so this is the semantic interoperability I'm talking about now, of course, there's also uh, an importance in technical interoperability. First, the systems have to uh, um, be able to um, exchange data with each other. There's the syntactic interoperability of the data formats, but all in all, it's just important um, that, we, that we are able to interpret the data correctly. And when I say we, I don't mean necessarily um, us as researchers, as humans, but I importantly, more, even more importantly, mean machines, right? If you have now a, a data set of 6 million, let's say, lab values, this is not to be opened in an Excel sheet and looked across and say, oh, what, what is meant by this unit or what is meant by that code? We cannot, we cannot grasp the, the, the sheer amount of the data anymore as a human, so it needs to be machine readable. And this is basically the, the entire, uh, one, one of the very, very big endeavors that uh, SPHN or challenges that SPHN is tackling. We try to make data or ensure data interoperability because when we look at the, at the um, um, size of this country, when we want to do big data research, we need to bring data together from different sources, right? If we look to the US, then there is probably one university, one academic hospital that has as many patients as whole Switzerland has. And of course, they always do it, they measure it in the same way. So there is a kind of given internal interoperability. But when we bring data together from different sources in Switzerland, we need to make sure that we are allowed to bring the data together and, ana and analyze it so that we do not compare apples with oranges. Is this a problem you also observe, Marcel Salate, that uh, data don't have the same semantics? Um, sure, although I, I mean, the, the work I do, of course, is on a much smaller scale. And so that we don't quite yeah, have the same 
um, amount of problems. But you know, as soon as you take data sources from elsewhere, you run exactly into these kinds of problems. So it's it is a serious issue, and I'm glad we're making that differentiation between semantic and technical operability, interoperability, because often it seems to me that people mean to say technical interoperability, where to me, it seems the biggest problem is really the semantic ones, because the technical, yeah, you have two data sources, you, you make it somehow work together. That's not usually the issue, but the issue is exactly what we just heard that, you know, what, what does it actually mean at the end of the day? And and that's that's a key problem we have everywhere. Mm -hmm. Agata Ferretti, what did you observe? You made your doctoral thesis on on big data and health. Um, what are the big issues in ethics? Yeah, I think uh, relates to what Marcel just mentioned. I think, for example, the technical um, interoperability is an issue when we look. At a, really at the global scale in the sense of um, including, for example, res big data research um, in the middle income countries where, of course, the access to, for example, smartphone is increasing, but the uh, access to big infrastructures is still not you know, um, not yet distributed in an equitable way. So it ends up that certain areas, in certain areas you can collect high quality data and uh, from, from let's say representative population that you want um, to research or analyze, but in other areas not. And then having these kind of biased data sets that are not representative uh, can can obviously uh, have an impact on the outcome of, of the research and um, as well as obviously um, create disparities in terms of access to healthcare potentially. So I think um, the technical aspects are really relevant in countries where a lot of, uh, we talk about electronic health records here in Switzerland, but in many countries, uh, obviously doctors are still taking notes with a pen and papers and often they're taking it you know with a look in the local languages and I think here in Switzerland we have a bit this because we have three different languages but when you have maybe 50 dialects it's way harder to create a system that you know combine all these different data so I think this uh, is also an important consideration to make. So we heard that we have uh, different systems all over Switzerland, um, and we are not sure where, whether we have the same semantics in Lugano, in Ticino, uh, in Geneva, and in, uh, at the City Hospital of Bern. And now, Moritz Feger, you are talking about an international governance in this field. Um, how can we overcome this national disparity and pro, uh, uh, progress to an international interoperability if we even don't manage it at our national level. What well, does Paul think about that? Maybe we don't even have to, to start coordinating. I mean, I would see it more, more in the way that we say, why not at the start uh, before, since we have this issue of uh, internal um, semantic interoperability, why don't just use the global standards that are being developed? I mean, there are standards that exist already. And, and as I was mentioning, the cooperation with, with uh, initiatives within the European Union, there's the eHealth network, there's work on this EU health data space. And why don't, why don't we look one be beyond the cantonal uh, barriers uh, and, and go directly, uh, at least at the regional level, or even, even uh, start, start a discussion uh, globally? I mean, of course, I know there's, there are differences and, and it, it's not always as straightforward, but I would, I would really um, encourage, uh, I mean, sometimes you have political reasons for this, I guess, but I would really encourage for, for leapfrogging and let's say this, this kind of uh, cantonal discussions and, and go, go beyond the, the Swiss borders because in the end, um, be it for research purposes or also Swiss citizens or European citizens traveling, like doing cross-border travels and, and uh, using also healthcare services beyond the Swiss border, um, this is really of, of benefit for, for all, I, I would say. A few years ago, I was at the FIAN conference and uh, personal, health, personal health was a great issue. Uh, Katrin Kramer, what can you tell us about the European collaboration in personal health? Um, so 
let me quickly uh, reply to what Moritz said. So this is actually what we're doing, right? We have very few standards that are very Swiss based. Um, the standard for our um, hospital for the procedures in hospitals, so that's CHOP is very Swiss, that is uh, unique uh, in the country, but we do not, I don't know any other uh, uh, very um, Swiss related standard. So basically we are um, working with international standards. Um, the problem is not that we, and the inf You're on sorry, yeah. sorry. Um, so um, let me get to this. It, I think in theory, it would be really easy, right? We would, all of us uh, in Switzerland, as well as in uh, other uh, European countries, uh, we would like to have structured data and we would like to have them standardized uh, according to internationally recognized standards. This is actually what we pursue in Switzerland, right? It's, it's, uh, it's not that we uh, work with uh, Swiss unique standards, we uh, work with international standards. But um, I can tell you the other European countries have the very same problem. So although there are standards, you know, we are talking about health or health related data and health related data, unless it is a clinical trial or a clinical study or a cohort study. So in, in, a, in a research setting is gathered in the healthcare system, not with a view on its use in research. So, and as uh, Agatha nicely pointed out before, you have the medical doctor with a pen in her hand and uh, writing down these things. And we are far away of having international standards introduced at the source by somebody who has a pen in his hand, right? And so this is the, this is the real problem. And this is what I meant with my very first statement that uh, everybody would like to use the data, but uh, nobody really uh, thinks deeper in what needs to, what, what kind of investment do we need to really make this possible? Because there is a big, big layer missing in the middle. We have the data that is gathered in the healthcare system, but then we need to build up this layer that this data is processed, is curated, is annotated, is standardized, is structured. And then we can talk about a healthy data ecosystem. But we, we, this layer is necessary. We cannot, and, and also the European countries, everybody has the same problem. Some are more advanced and this is tightly connected with the digitization of the healthcare system. And um, uh, some who are not, um, where the healthcare system is not uh, far advanced in, digitiz in terms of digitization, there we really have to do investments now. On the other hand, we are collaborating very nicely. Um, just to answer your question, Claudia, with, uh, within the European uh, community, we are also uh, participating in all these uh, very important initiatives um, uh, like the, the data um, eco um, spaces, but also the Elixir is a very important initiative. GA4GH is even a global initiative when it comes to standardization of data. So we participate in all of that. The problem is just making this being able to make this bridge from the healthcare setting to the research setting. And if you would like to bridge the healthcare and the data setting to the political setting, to the governance setting, to international Geneva, what would you need from a think tank as for us? You asked to, help, to help your work you, you told us you are collaborating well, but there is a layer with, which is not there yet. And for us, thinks that we should work closer together. So what would you need from a think tank as for us to be able to go ahead? So actually, uh, if you ask me this question, my needs are uh, rather not on the level of a think tank. My needs are in uh, really IT infrastructure, money investment, uh, and on, on a deeper level. So maybe Marcel or Moritz want to answer that question. So I think we should, we, we have to invest bottom up, right? We have to first prepare all the countries and then uh, we can talk about the, the overall uh, level of collaboration. Okay. Then this is a question for Marcel Salate. Uh, in our pre-discussion, you told me there is a fear that Switzerland could miss the connection, not only the European connection, but the connection with modern personalized health and digitalization in healthcare system. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a concern. And I think it's, it's, you know, we've seen bits and pieces of that um, 
in this extremely unusual event of a pandemic. But, you know, the things that you see then, right, that don't just happen like this overnight. Um, I think it's, it's a typical situation where all of a sudden you see these problems on a systemic level. I mean, we've been talking about digital issues, right? Basically one month after the next, and that is not a coincidence, right? These weren't just randomly, suddenly many digital problems, but the, the pandemic swept away this, this layer um, that sort of was caching these, these and hiding these problems. And, and in a crisis, of course, these things tend to break and become visible relatively quickly. And so, you know, at minimum, we should take that as a wake up call I mean, things are happening incredibly quickly. I'm still not convinced that the majority of people, which is one thing, but even of the decision makers understand the scope of the, of the technological change that is already happening, let alone, right, that we will face in five years. And we're still sort of dealing with making sure we don't fax each other anymore. So there, right, um, I I don't know what needs to happen. I mean, um, I'm trying to push where I can, you know, trying not to break things. Um, but it's 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 a very frustrating process to be to be quite frank. And I think this was a point where for hours started to think, wasn't it, Moritz? Yeah. So so way to compliment on on our role where we see our role in this in this discussion is really to raise awareness within the public, but also with within uh, the decision-making field so that, that, they, that there is an awareness that there's a political priority to put there and also financial resources to put there, as, as Captain Tamari said, of course. Um, and just to react on the financial side, uh, I think at the European level, there has been some awareness uh, with the EU for Health program. There has been a few billions put on the table, um, which is what was, the, the budget was quite, uh, was, um, was uh, increased quite highly. And also on the side of, of uh, Making making data interoperable, 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 and and seeing this kind of priority. Of course, it's uh, there's still much more needed. But um, my feeling was that in within the European Union, at least, there was some uh, priority uh, political priority seen there. Um, but so yeah, we see our role in raising awareness, um, bringing these questions and challenges and needs to the, the, to the on the table of decision makers. And then, and then hopefully having some impact then later on when they when there's uh, political reforms and changes. Thanks a lot. Um, may I have a result already from the survey, Caroline? Do you have enough data to show us what our public thinks? Okay. Um, we have 91% of our public, which likes a lot to give their health data in an anonymized form um for research and we have 73 percent to have their covid app on the phone and we have 95 percent who would use the covid certificate as mr salate told us there is more urgency to travel than to protect ourselves and it's not on a voluntary basis that's interesting and um, more than half of our public would use an, a device because uh, the purpose is high for yourself or for others. 55% uh, think it's important to uh, have an answer uh, which is anonymous and 18% don't know a lot. This is maybe not a re relevant um, per, uh, distribution for our Swiss population, but for our panel, and um, it's interesting. What do you think about it, uh, Agatha Ferret? Did, did you expect this kind of answers? Well, they're really interesting and um, shows probably that, as you said, the, the Swiss public is um, probably well informed, so it's not that they need more information that, or I mean, they might need some, but they already consider themselves well informed. And um, they what, what I see is that they really pose attention on the anonymization. Uh, however, I have to say that, yeah, the, the discussion there has been um, in, in the literature is that, you know, 
the, the entire topic of when data is anonymous um, is gonna is raising questions because in the future and already now so many data are collected and and Katrin was mentioning from different data sources, health data sources, but also non-traditional data sources like social media data, searches online, um, credit card purchases, or many others, right? And once you combine and integrate all this data, they might reveal information about the user, the data subjects, um, uh, even though they're not, you know, uh, personal data necessarily. And they might reveal very, very um, significant information about health for example. And so the entire idea of having anonymous data might not be sufficient in the future when we can infer information even from anonymized data, right? So I think we, we have to carefully consider this. And despite, again, this goes back to something that has been um, touched upon before, that um, also, again, at the European level, we really stress the idea of privacy, privacy by design, but maybe these approaches are not covering the entire spectrum of ethical issues that might emerge in the future or already emerging uh, concerning, for example, data ownership, data control, um, the research accountability, but also the fair distribution of risk and benefits associated with the use of this data. And I think these questions are still up uh, to be discussed and to be really analyzed more in detail and thought through. And so in this sense, I think Switzerland is not late because has still time and, and should take time to, to really explore these questions that are worth being explored um, and not be superficial, let's say, in this in approaching these questions. How, we sh how should we then approach projects on health data? So we, we saw we are quite advanced in the mindset. On the other hand, we are quite ca uh, careful about the um, personal freedom and we are a little bit late in the technical side. Um, Katrin Kramery, what would you counsel us to do? Well, actually, there are, I mean, if we look at it on a very uh, basic level, there are two possibilities, right? We could gather data in one spot and, you know, researchers love to have data on one spot because it's uh, easier to deal with. But there is also the, the concept of federated compute. So basically you do not uh, bring the data to the place of the analysis, but you bring the analysis uh, algorithms or uh, workflows to the data. So data can basically stay where it is and uh, it has to be organized, that, that's uh, uh, undisputed, but, um, uh, and of course interoperable, but then we can basically leave it where it is and we can send the analysis to the data. So this, would, this is basically a, a concept that is uh, now uh, uh, of growing um, importance and also interest internationally. Um, you do not have to send the data cross borders anymore. You can keep the data in the country for exactly the reasons that Agatha nicely pointed out. Uh, we do not know what tomorrow brings and if we have the data um, at the location where it's actually captured or in let's say at least local uh, repositories uh, there is a good leverage and a good control to it a better control to it so this is this would be one aspect that we uh, that we could uh, put forward saying we now uh, in switzerland we get organized in a way that um, we allow more of this privacy preserving computation methodologies where data is kept uh, where they are on the other hand, when you bring data, if there is a necessity or the need to bring data together, um, as uh, we see it um, in the SPHN uh, initiative, for example, our data um, providers like the university hospitals, they are very well aware of their responsibility towards those data. So what we do, and this is really, uh, people say, well, data gets out of the hospital to the researcher. There is a big, big step in between. And this is the preparation of the data in the hospitals, the de-identification. So the getting rid of all the identifying um, um, components of this data, this is really a, a, a big task itself. So basically I can, I can give you, for instance, um, hospitals even shift information about a date of a, of a visit or an encounter per patient. So that even if, as Agatha said, you could be able to re-identify somebody if you have the re-identifying uh, information to compare it to, you would 
uh, have a harder time to re-identify somebody because the dates are shifted, right? And so in order to do that uh, in, a, in a way that research can really deal with the data, you have to do that, of course, in the, in the similar fashion for each patient within one research project. And you have to do it in a different fashion for the same patient in another research project. So there's a lot of work going into de-identification of data, which is exactly necessary for the reasons that we heard. So these, but I, I only actually see the two possibilities. Either we take care that the data is properly de-identified as good as we as we can do this, and I think the the next step when we gather data in one spot would be we shouldn't give the data out of hands, right? It should not be a data set that is given from one and to the next to the next person. Because I, me as a patient, I signed a general consent agreeing that my data can be used for research uh, purposes. Maybe I want to change my mind and maybe I want to withdraw this general consent uh, that I once gave. How is this going to be respected if a data set is out there and given from one hand to the other, nobody knows that I actually withdrew my uh, general consent. How should they know? Right. So it makes a lot of sense to really keep data close to the to the place where, where it is uh, captured and where people have the uh, take the responsibility seriously uh, in order to preserve a privacy of the patient who agreed to use the data. So keep data close to where it's uh, captured. Marcel Salate, would you be able to do research if data is kept close? Um. Well, depends on the research, but yeah, I mean, as a, as a, as a principle, I would say it's it's great, right? It, this is this should be the starting point, and you know, it's not it's not the coincidence, of course, that the Swiss COVID approach was that to the extreme, right? Where 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 no sensitive data um, about the contacts ever left the phone, and you could still um, do the kind of you know reach your goal which I think has to be the central question, right? What is actually the goal and how much data do we need for that? And it often turns out on, on you know, second thought. I mean, at the moment we see, we live in an environment where everybody wants just more data, data, data. Um, but when thinking a bit more carefully, it often turns out that for the specific problem you're trying to solve, maybe there isn't that much data necessary. Or then you come to a sort of middle way where you say we do it in a federated way, or then the last way would be to say let's all do it in a centralized way. But I think it has it. The reflections should in the future maybe start from that end, and not start from the from the from the point that everything should be centralized, and then you f reflect could it maybe also be a bit decentralized, but the other way around. Thanks a lot, Moritz. You uh, mentioned in your presentation also the issue on the, of the COVID certificate. What did Farao think about the COVID um, certificate? Okay, so maybe first a disclaimer, it's uh, what do I think as a, as a member of Farao, as an author of Farao on the COVID certificate? The, the organization doesn't have an official stance on it, but um, well, um, I believe it's, uh, it's Anyways, uh, coming. It's anyways already on 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 the on the way in Switzerland, in within the European Union worldwide as well in other countries. And so what what uh, what, what we see is we need to align uh, the systems. We need to have comparable criteria. We we need to have follow common guidelines. And there, the World Health Organization is working within this uh, smart vaccination uh, working group, which is at the moment working on vaccination data, but it's actually going to include also data from uh, lab tests and, and PCR tests and so on. Um, at least that's, uh, that's what has been announced. Um, we, need, we need states to follow these, uh, these international guidelines, uh, which are coming, which are still being, uh, being developed, but um, to have systems that, that, can, um, that can be uh, used in a cross-border context, because it, there's no use in having uh, a hundred and so so many uh, national systems, uh, and then you would have to to do your certificate in in in, in different uh, in different uh, countries and different systems. Um, so so the opinion here is that we need to follow the gui guidelines uh, in the line internationally or at least regionally, uh, looking at where where would for, for Switzerland of course the European Union is is quite important and there Switzerland announced 
that the Swiss system is going to be compatible with the um, interoperable with the, the EU system. But um, but yeah, here the it's not really is it a good or bad thing. It's more how are we how de designing these uh, internationally and, and what are what are the criteria used? Um, yeah. Agatha Peretti, the COVID certificate is this about technical interoperability or about ethical standards? I think it's about both, and and uh, again, I, I haven't done much research in this field, so um, I can just express what I, I personally think about it. But um, so I think if we take the standpoint of of Moritz, that is a fact that is going to happen, despite, for example, what the WHO like the fact that, for example, WHO explicitly warns against the use of these certificates uh, for international travels and. Many experts in the ethics field uh, also warns against um, the, the potential implications of this. I think if we go for it, we should for sure do it in a way that is uh, really fair also towards those who are not vaccinated. Because again, if you uh, associate privileges for people that are vaccinated, that can access certain services, that can do certain things and others not, really you create, um, you just do not um, create an unfair society, but you might even exacerbate uh, inequalities that exist in this society. And uh, furthermore, I think it's really important to be transparent about the use of the data that are collected. And of course, in ethics, we uh, and in bioethics, in the history of bioethics, there is um, this attention toward potentially slippery slopes. So if you start collecting personal data uh, about the, you know, the, the vaccination, uh, maybe this, this card will be required in a few years to, uh, you know, introduce other health data in the same place and, and government have access to it. So I think it, we, we have to be really careful in this sense and maybe also think to potentially speed up with vaccinations, which are really the, like the, the tools that we have at the moment to um, allow for reopenings and also economic growth rather than rely entirely on these, on these certificates. Maybe um, there are many countries in which a lot of people I think would like to be vaccinated, but still there is a lack of access to va vaccinations. And so I think to make not uh, to to not increase these um, inequalities, which should actually push towards um, a better, you know, better provisions of vaccines. Thanks a lot, Marcel Salate. Did you uh, have any observations about the COVID certificate or insights? Well, it depends. It depends on on what level. I mean, as you may know, I'm personally not a big fan of, of this certificate um, because um, in the time when they are actually necessary, they, they, they are a potential danger for creating this kind of in unequal access to services. And, and when they're not, when there a sufficient amount of people is vaccinated, then they're not that necessary anymore. So at the same time, right, we're building this digital infrastructure where we get to decide who passes through this door and who doesn't. And that bothers me a bit. I think we have lots of things to do. We have many problems, um, many things we should catch up on on digital. Not sure that building this kind of uh, infrastructure would be the thing to do. That said, um, you know, the simple observation is that we don't get to set the rules outside of Switzerland. And there, of course, I, I, I applaud the government for, for quickly moving on this issue to make sure that you know, people living in Switzerland have then the ability to travel, to travel ab abroad where this certificate may be necessary, but I, I'd like to see it used as little as possible in Switzerland. We just arrived at our final round. Did Switzerland miss the connection? Maybe from your different perspectives, you could uh, answer once more this question in one or two sentences. Would you like to start, um, Agatha Ferretti? Sure. Um, well, I think, no, Switzerland hasn't yet <laughs> missed the chance to you know, embrace the digitalization of the health sector. And I think this will bring a lot of, or 
yeah, for sure will bring a lot of opportunities. However, I think it's really important on the one hand that we should really engage all the stakeholders, including uh, as was mentioned before the public and um, including their perspective and sitting at the table. And although, and I saw in the in the questions also in the chat is complicated and is, is challenging to you, you see find a common agreement or a minimal common ground. I think uh, this should be uh, nevertheless attempt at least at, at the societal level. And um, at, on the other hand, I think it's really important to, um, to bring us back to what Maurice said at the beginning, to set a kind of standards that can be um, uh, respected at the, at the international level, special governance standards, ethical standards, and uh, be sure that the different parties uh, understand each other when they talk about fairness, when they talk about privacy, when they talk about um, uh, you know, um, data control uh, in a way that, again, research and, and um, in general development of uh, digital health technologies can um, happen in, in an ethical way. Thanks a lot. Um, just because it's close to our closing time, um, Maurice Beger, two sentences. What should be the next step uh, so as not to miss the connection? Well said, uh, the right priorities. Um, I have highlighted it that uh, there is the European Union initiatives, which are quite important and in the long run also for the citizen and uh, the ac academic, academic environment. Um, and I would say uh, set also political priorities in, in this regard. Okay. Um, Katrin Kramery. Um, I don't think that we are already too that we are already too late in Switzerland, but I'm very convinced that we should act fast. And I think for this, it needs clearly the political willingness. It needs an incentive uh, on the one hand side because uh, clearly waiting that it happens by itself uh, as a coincidence or having just hope that digitization is driving itself forward that will definitely make us lose the connection. <laughs> Thanks a lot, um, Marce Salate. You are, yes. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, I agree with what was said, but I, I do think we we may be lacking a missing piece in terms of um, infrastructure, possibly also political infrastructure. I mean, that a country like Switzerland can't get um, an electronic patient record up and running in 20 years. That to me means a systemic failure, right? That there's something, an element missing that should be there. Um, and that is, I don't know, I guess that, that involves politics, that involves um, the civil society, that also involves the, the, the um, yeah, sc schools and universities. Um, I can't quite put my finger on it what it is, but I'm increasingly having the sense that we're missing a player in this, in this whole digitization advan uh, adventure. And maybe Forhaus can, um, can think about what that structure should be. I'd be happy to help. Thanks a lot. Maybe there is also some cantonal and federal structures which are not so easy. Um, but let's hope that we will see our patient's record. Uh, some years ago, I um, worked in this section for about a year and got some insight. I thought it was a brilliant team and I really hope that we will get a patient record sooner or later. Thanks a lot for this um, science afternoon, for getting together. Thanks a lot for questions and remarks we got. And let's uh, build bridges uh, between disciplines and between partners. Thanks a lot for us that you were here. And thanks, many thanks to our panelists. Um, the academies are here to uh, talk um, larger on on these topics. And thank you for being with us today. Have a nice evening or afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you.